Molt bé, bona tarda. Gràcies per estar aquí. Avui fem la quarta sessió d'aquest cicle de Dijous de Ciència sobre l'economia de la ciència i la tecnologia i tenim l'honor, el plaer de tenir aquí amb nosaltres Jean-Pierre Borgunyon, que ara la Marta Sanz farà la seva presentació. Té un perfil interessant que amb la conferència d'avui ens transmetrà que és millorar el dinamisme i l'ambició dels investigadors, investigadores i investigadors europeus, un esforç clau cap al futur d'Europa. Doncs l'agraïm al Jean-Pierre Bourgogneon que estigui aquí avui amb nosaltres. Merci beaucoup pour être ici. I dono la paraula a la Marta Sanz, que farà la presentació del nostre convidat d'avui. Benvinguts a tots i totes. En primer lloc, voldria agrair a la presidenta de la secció, l'Alícia, i també als organitzadors dels Dijous de Ciència, en Miquel Canals i el Jaume Miranda, que m'hagin fet aquest encàrrec, que per mi és un encàrrec superagradable, el de presentar el conferenciant d'avui, el meu amic i col·lega Jean-Pierre Bourguignon. Dins de l'àmbit general del coneixement, el professor Bourguignon és conegut per haver estat l'anterior president de l'European Research Council fins a l'any 2021, fins al setembre de l'any 2021, crec. Però nosaltres, com a matemàtics, el coneixem per la seva obra matemàtica en geometria diferencial i aplicacions a la física matemàtica. El coneixem també per haver estat un gran gestor i desenvolupador dins del marc de les infraestructures de recerca per les matemàtiques. En particular, va ser el director durant 20 anys de l'Institut d'Etudes Científiques, que és una institució de recerca en matemàtiques i física matemàtica de gran prestigi, no sols europeu, sinó mundial i també el tenim ben conegut per tota la seva tasca que ha fet com a servei a la comunitat, que va culminar amb la seva presidència a la Societat Matemàtica Europea. Hi ha finalment una altra faceta que potser no la coneixem tant nosaltres aquí, que és la de pensador i assagista i és a dir, totes les seves idees més filosòfiques que va desgranant en les seves conferències. I jo crec que alguna vegada ho escriurà, ho escriurà alguna cosa, de moment es troba una mica dispers en conferències en diverses institucions com avui aquí i espero que això ho puguem també detectar avui. Bon, je te remercie beaucoup d'avoir accepté cette invitation et voilà, on est prêt à, à, à t'écouter. Merci beaucoup, Jean-Pierre. So first, I need to apologize not being able to speak in Catalan, but uh, I'll, I'll switch to English then. Many thanks for the invitation to lecture at the Institut de Studies Catalans and speak about enhancing the dynamism and the ambition of European researchers, a key endeavor for Europe's future. It also gives me the, the opportunity to meet old friends and one more possibility to visit Barcelona, one of my favorite cities in Europe. For this lecture, you suggested a few themes I could speak about. More than a year ago, I chose the one I just quoted. At this time, we expected that by now, the pandemic would be gone. We know this is not really the case, even if thanks to massive campaigns of vaccination and in spite of the persisting misinformation about their fantastic success, its most damaging effects are more or less under control. In terms of defining the future, the day 24 February of this year is an even more dramatic turning point. With the invasion of, in, invasion of Ukraine by the Russian army, we have re-entered an explicitly fractured world when we thought that the openness would be, was the new paradigm. Scientific cooperation may be challenged, although we know that for the quality of the research and the stability of the world, it is of paramount 
paramount importance to keep the flow of exchanges between scientists. New massive migrations of scientists may also develop. The economic consequences of this drastic change are not yet clear. We may need a few years to have a better view about it. One of the key parameters will be the level of inflation we will have to live with. The impact on the development of research in Europe, the topic I want to talk about, will certainly be major. It is sure, for example, that security issues will play a much bigger role than before, with a significant impact on budgets available for non-military expenditures. We're indeed entering times of great uncertainty. This probably means we will have to dedicate a lot more efforts to convince young students that becoming a researcher is an exciting and viable option. A key message to pass on is that Europe needs them badly. Let's, let us examine some of the steps to be taken. First, one needs to always keep in mind that all this takes place in the context of a, quote, research and innovation ecosystem, end of quote, which involves several elements that cannot be considered separately. And we must never forget that at the foundation of the whole system, there are human beings. Hence, the first key step for Europe is to create the conditions to attract and give access to its education system to the brightest people, in particular at university level. Any kind of segregation will be counterproductive. A second step comes later, <clears throat> namely to keep a proportion of them to work in the academic and research sectors at least for some years after they graduated. This may be a new challenge, as I will explain later. Taking a historic perspective and looking back, we can be proud that after having let other regions and continents take the lead in knowledge development for centuries or even millennia, Europe managed to give birth to the Renaissance and later to the Enlightenment, and then somewhat later, but not independently of the latter, to the scientific and industrial revolutions. Such a historic look reminds us that the world is never static. Going back to a so-called glorious past has never been an adequate source of inspiration. This is especially true in the world we are living in today that is changing at an accelerated pace and faces some unexpected disruptions besides the one scientists have anticipated which need to be dealt with. The worldwide competition for brains is fierce. Asia advances at a fantastic pace after some of its countries, Taos Korea is one of them, have been making massive and sustained investments in education, something we should always remind European policymakers is key. I bring you a piece of good news in the form of an information drawn from the large scale surveys of researchers called the MORE studies run regularly by the European Commission. The most recent one, MORE 4, run in 2020 in almost, is almost fully focused on comparing the European situation to the rest of the world with extensive data on mobility between the different groups of countries. The MORE 3 report conducted in 2017 was published in 2018. There one reads that researchers are highly motivated and research jobs tend to be attractive by their very nature, in particular because of the freedom of action they offer. People go into research for the intellectual challenge because they have a sense of curiosity about the world. The ambition is to work with leaders in their fields or even to create a new field of their own. This is why depriving research of their freedom is a sure way of getting them to flee. It is therefore critical to defend academic freedom, one of the key core values of Europe, and we know that it is challenged in some member states. Still, we need to make sure that the pandemic has not introduced a major change in the attitude of researchers. I will come back to this crucial point later in my talk. Of course, material working conditions, including remuneration, job stability, or even pensions, and other non-science-related conditions do influence which job one chooses. However, year after year, when asked, researchers say that these are not the decisive factors for job or mobility decisions. What these surveys show is that researchers are willing to trade material working conditions against the right conditions for carrying out their research. 
The things that are most important to researchers are securing a position in a stimulating environment, having access to research funding and facilities, enjoying scientific autonomy, having the chance to work with leading researchers, finding a reasonable time balance between teaching and research, and a critical element, being provided with some long-term career perspective. In this study, overall, 74%, I'm going back to the more three study, 74% of researchers in Europe across all countries and career stages declare that they are satisfied with their research condition. However, this level of satisfaction varies widely by country and, by country and career stage, a fact that certainly does not surprise you. And again, we need to check whether after two years of restrictions imposed during the pandemic, the situation has not become significantly different. A study carried out last year among Gary Slodowska Curie Fellows by the European Commission shows that 83% of them consider that the pandemic had a negative or very negative impact on the development of their research project. Moreover, this category of researchers, the Marie Slodowska Curie Fellows, is among the ones having in average a rather favorable situation. For me, the most worrying issue is the dissatisfaction of many of our young researchers with their career prospects. Going back to the MOR3 study, taking together data by country and by career stage, leading researchers in northern European countries are the most satisfied with their career perspectives, and young researchers in southern Europe the least satisfied. This certainly is a key explanation why, for example, 25% of potential researchers in Italy decide to prepare their PhD abroad, by far the largest proportion of all European, in all European countries. Italy is followed by Hungary at 16%, and then by the Netherlands by 8%. But it is striking that in nearly every country, it is the early stage researchers who are less satisfied with their career perspectives. This indicates the negative effect of recent changes in the environment in which young researchers have to evolve. My generation was far better treated. When I left school, I got at least three serious offers to continue for a PhD. Actually, I was hired by the CNRS when I was 21. Unthinkable today. Indeed, today young researchers are often employed on temporary short-term contracts for the purpose to help carry out specific research projects. This is to the detriment of academic independence, job security, and sufficient social stability. It also means that young researchers often feel forced to move, an a priori positive step from a career perspective, to get some support, even if they do not wish to do so. This, by the way, penalizes women more than men and certainly contributes to the so-called leaking pi pipeline situation which sees over the career evolution the proportion of women scientists step by step diminish. On the other hand, either a trace of another age or a proof of the power they still retain, senior researchers who are often employed on permanent contracts progress mostly by seniority and not according to their performance. This is not just unfortunate for individuals, in particular for the next generation. It is a problem for European science. Indeed, it is vital for Europe's future development and competitiveness to ensure that research remains attractive to the most talented elements of the next generation, and that their decision to leave the research ecosystem is not only based on the lack of prospects. The Scientific Council of the European Research Council has recognized this issue from the outset. In its very first meeting in October 2005, before the ERC itself had come into existence as a program, it stated the ambition to give, I quote, a real opportunity to young researchers and new teams, end of quote. And it is with this in mind that the ERC Scientific Council decided to give support to five-year projects and to allocate almost two-thirds of the overall ERC budget to its starters and consolidators grant schemes. These grants are for young researchers who submitted convincing, convincing ambitious projects, substantial, long-term funding, and the freedom to pursue their own ideas. By now, about 8,000 of them have been distributed. 
In other words, these contracts are designed to provide young researchers with the adequate conditions I've been talking about. They also empower them with their host institutions, as the signing of an ERC grant comes with strict obligations for institutions and provides strong guarantees to researchers. I know that some institutions resent it, but they should think twice about policies whereby they too often try to tell researchers what to do, certainly a wrong attitude. Ensuring that the most original and high-caliber young researchers can develop their work in Europe is a key element to give them enough confidence that they have a future in Europe. What we see in reality is the ERC-inspiring efforts of ambition countries and institutions. Under the leadership of Professor Andrew Mascolel, the Catalan government has taken a number of structural measures to make Catalonia more attractive to researchers. And these worked remarkably well. Now, if one uses the number of ERC grantees as a measure of success, Catalonia is the region in space attracting the largest number of ERC grants. ERC grantees set an inspirational front for bottom-up research in Europe. Several countries have now developed programs inspired by the ERC and having similar objectives. Beyond providing means to daring projects, the ERC encourages European universities and research organizations to assess their relative strengths and weaknesses and brings about reforms. Another contribution that ERC funding makes is that ERC grantees are able to start or consolidate their, their, consolidate their own teams. Each ERC grantee has on average 7.5 team members, with over 50% of them being doctoral students and postdoctoral fellows. This means that ERC grants also provide opportunities to thousands of the earlier stage researchers to get invaluable experience working with a highly motivated principal investigator on a cutting edge project. One can say that the ERC played and must continue to play its part in creating an attractive environment to do research in Europe. But to succeed further, a concerted effort by authorities and institutions across Europe is required. One critical aspect of the action needed is to ensure that open, transparent, and merit-based recruitment procedures are in place in public research institutions across Europe. In many member states, public research institutions, in particular universities, often have little autonomy over hiring. So whereas private sector recruitment in Europe is mostly open and competitive, inbred recruitment is still widespread in the public sector. Researchers are a relatively small and highly specialized workforce. Therefore, it will not always be possible to find the best qualified researcher within any single national environment, let alone within a single institution. The widespread adoption of open recruitment in the public sector is therefore likely to improve Europe's research performance as well as to provide more opportunities for talented researchers. Steps forward in this direction need to be taken. Surveys show that in certain countries, researchers perceive the public institution's recruitment rules and procedures to be neither fair nor transparent. When asked if recruitment at their own institution was merit-based, 77% of EU researchers answered yes. However, there, are, there were again wide differences between countries. For example, over 83% of researchers from the Czech Republic, Denmark, Iceland, Malta, Sweden, and UK answered yes, but only 55% in Hungary, 61% in Italy or Portugal, and 63% in Spain. As we must give due consideration to the reasons why researchers want to enter this demanding career, I want to emphasize the need for researchers to have the time and freedom to explore new knowledge. Too often, in recent years, the legitimate effort to provide tertiary education to a higher proportion of a generation has happened without creating the teacher's position needed to absorb the extra load. In many countries, the net result has been a negative impact, sometimes a drastic one, on the time available for research. Another key aspect, it is very important that policymakers and politicians understand 
that a significant part of the research funding should be organized using the bottom-up approach, the best to motivate researchers. There has always been an inherent tension between the demands of policymakers for innovation, which they link with short-term improved productivity and economic growth, and the deeply rooted interest of scientists in curiosity-driven research, requiring that one takes a longer perspective. Of course, after the extraordinary success of supporting a long-term curiosity-driven perspective provided by the development of an mRNA vaccine to protect from the COVID infection in record time, we should be in a drastically better position to defend the view that the understanding of basic phenomena and the funds needed to make this possible can lead to dramatically positive effects on the society at large. Sadly, a lot of disinformation has somewhat undermined such a fantastic feat for science-based action. Still, faced with the need to do some cuts, it, it seems that policymakers and politicians are too often tempted to cut basic research funding basic research funding first. It is indeed easier to say that one funds the path to technology X or the solution to problem Y than to say one funds a more open-ended quest for new knowledge. It is true that when you ask when a specific result in basic research will have an impact, it is not possible to give a uniformly valid answer. But when one looks in retrospect and takes a more global view, Never, never forget the mRNA vaccine story. It is clear that they are all sectors of the present economy that are born from ac absolutely not programmed or even anticipated fundamental discoveries. In some cases, the benefits come first, in others less so. Come fast, I'm sorry, and in others less so. But if you do not make the effort of accepting to take proper risks, you will miss what can be a radically new turning point and the new activities that will result from it. It is a fact that one cannot program scientific breakthroughs or order them as if for a men from a menu. One simply doesn't know what one doesn't know. One cannot foresee the consequences of what is discovered, but one knows that some breakthroughs will change deeply our understanding of the world and give access uh, and give <coughs> access to us to completely new worlds. To give one more example, think of medical imaging, an engineering domain which would not have been made the fantastic progress we all benefit from without a truly multidisciplinary interaction between mathematics, computer science, physics, chemistry, and of course, biology and medicine that nurtured its steady and truly amazing steps forward. What we can say is that economic history reveals the central role played by science and innovation in the growth of industrialized nations. Many important new products in industries ranging from pharmaceuticals to information technology have their origins in publicly funded research conducted at universities and research institutions. Many of the commercially successful inventions we now take for granted and which have driven economic growth in the last decades come from research conducted with no commercial purpose. This was clearly stated by Claude Shannon, one of the founders of information theory that lies at the, at the heart of all the tools we are using daily from cell phones to television and that made the internet possible. Here is a quote from him. I'm very seldomly interested in applications I'm more interested in the elegance of a problem. Is it a good problem? An interesting problem, end of quote. So without curiosity-driven basic research, many critical applied research endeavors to solve real problems would not exist, sometimes because the concepts necessary to grasp the problems in the right way and the technical tools to address them would not be available. The innovation process is complex with many linkages and feedback mechanism, and it too needs to be understood at a systemic level. It is also increasingly global. Today, it is clear that innovation doesn't follow a neat linear model in which an innovation follows directly and rapidly from a research project, with the benefits captured in the same geographical location as the research takes place. 
separating research from innovation by walls doesn't correspond at all to today's reality of the economic development. If we look at regions and countries which are the most successful innovators, their success is without exception built on the foundation of excellent science. This foundation doesn't just produce new knowledge, but also many of the benefits such as, <clears throat> such as a highly skilled researchers and graduates, new instruments and methods, access to international networks, new ways of working as well as new technologies and spin-off companies. All things that can be found here in Barcelona. This is even more true when a country or region moves closer to the technological frontier. At certain early stages of their development, countries can take a catch-up path simply by adopting, ad adopting existing technologies. This becomes increasingly difficult as economies mature. Long-term funding for ambitious projects frees researchers from having to focus on immediate impact, from thinking of the next publication, from thinking about what to write in the next grant application. It allows researchers to really focus on the core of their research. This is why it is of paramount importance to encourage people to take risks. In this way, we have the best chance that their work leads to genuinely new knowledge and in some cases even to radical breakthroughs. We need to see acceptance of the, uh, pro this approach spreading. My personal experience teach me, teaches me that business leaders do understand very well the importance of government support for fundamental research. They do understand the wider benefits of excellent science. I mentioned before, in particular, high-tech companies need a highly skilled, trained, and versatile people. This strong appetite has even become a threat for, for public research because challenged by the very substantial transitions they must achieve in their business, industry and services leaders will look, and even more than in, rec even more than in the recent past, into hiring massively master students because of their exposure to latest developments without even giving them the opportunity to go for a PhD. Before coming to my conclusion, I would like to mention an initiative I've been fighting for, I've, I've been fighting for about a year. Finally, thanks to the great support I received from Manuel Haito, who was the Portuguese Minister for Science and Research until recently, on 7 of June, a conference to assess the impact of the pandemic on the career of young researchers will take place in Brussels. The present organizers are the Portuguese agency Ciencia Viva and the association, the association Initiative for Science in Europe as the fourth Mayano Gago conference on research policy. We hope that other organizations will join the effort, more support is needed urgently, thus making reaching out to relevant data easier. Some institutions did look into the matter but by far, data collection on the issue has not been systematic enough. These disparities also reflect the fact that the impact varies considerably between countries and disciplines, and depends on measures adopted locally to deal with the issue. Still, some of the information gathered is especially worrying. A detailed analysis conducted among young researchers at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm showed a negative impact for almost half of them on various aspects of their research. A study conducted in the United Kingdom by Vitae on researchers' mental health and well-being showed that about 50% of young researchers suffer from probable depression, with 20% more of possible depression. This is more than twice the figure for adults in the UK and among them for senior researchers. This clearly indicates that more attention needs to be given to mental health and well-being in the research ecosystem. It is now time for me to conclude. Let me first state without ambiguity that to be successful and to play the key role they ought to play in the development of the societies they are embedded in, all research systems need a regular flow of open positions and the core of stable funding. This is particularly important to help provide a sustainable career path for motivated and talented young researchers. Competitive funding, and in particular its bottom-up part, has also its role to play as it is fundamental to allow researchers the freedom
to pursue their most ambitious ideas with a not too short horizon. To me, Europe faces the danger of satisfying itself with a system where career stability is being dangerously eroded without increasing room for bold initiatives. Moreover, project funding is too often assigned to very specific, politically chosen ways of working with short-term goals and specific narrow priorities. Bottom-up funding has presently become remarkably rare when it should be given a much higher priority. My first plea, therefore, is that sufficient diversity in the funding mechanisms, programs, and institution, institutional settings at national and European levels must be preserved, scientific quality being the main driver of the selection. One must keep in mind that in the present situation, the European support to research innovation only represent 9% of the fund provided by the European budget. Major efforts to get the Horizon Europe budget for 2021-2027 reach 120 billions have failed after the massive cut decided at the July 2020 European summit. This amount was considered the minimum, actually an absolute minimum, by the LAMI group, which had the mission to prepare Horizon Europe, the European Parliament, and the European Table for Industry, which brings together all the major uh, companies in Europe. The ERC was set up in 2007 after a long struggle by scientific communities. This proves that Europe can still innovate and create new dynamic institutions. I'm convinced we must and can do much more. We need a Europe that can innovate. We need a Europe that is agile and responsive. My second plea to you is to get your active support for assessing the impact of the pandemic on the career of young researchers. This will require means and the mobilization of the scientific community at large, senior as well as junior researchers, in order to collect data and to imagine solutions when the problems are identified. With my renewed thank, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Pierre, for um, this uh, very interesting uh, talk. So um, uh, we will now start with questions uh, from the audience, and also, also there are some, some questions already uh, in the chat. Uh, so there are some questions here. It can be in French or in Catalan or in English, as you wish. So, Enrique Banda, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jean-Pierre, for your uh, presentation today. Um, uh, it's very difficult to disagree with you, actually. But I have a question uh, which maybe your experience can tell us. Uh, how big should the ERC be? I mean, one thinks of the a country like the United States, where the National Science Foundation has a, a budget of about eight billion or eight thousand uh, million dollars. Um, what would be the right size for ERC in Europe? Well, it's a difficult question. <laughs> you know, the present budget for ERC yearly is about two point four billion a year. Uh, you mentioned uh, the NSF. Uh, the NSF uh, has uh, bottom up uh, as some project, some programs which are bottom up. Most programs of NSF are bottom up, but not all. So I think if you take the comparable figure for the US, it's uh, it's about six billion. But the key point, uh, as you know, is that the funding coming at European level is by far not the most part of the support to research. Most of the support is still coming from the countries with a huge disparities between the, the countries, where countries, uh, as you know, I mean, uh, typically northern countries, but also Germany, uh, have now gone over 3% of their budget, 3% uh, uh, of GDP uh, to support research innovation. By the way, counting together public and private uh, support to research. Uh, some other countries are much, much lower. I think presently Romania is at 0.5% uh, of GDP, partly because in Romania there is very, very little money coming from the private sector. 
So, of course, uh, in most uh, developed countries, I mean, the support from the private sector is typically two-thirds of the expenses in GDP. At presently, worldwide, the two countries which spend the most on uh, support to research are South Korea and uh, Israel, 4.3%, 4.2% of GDP. France is uh, still has been totally stagnant at 2.2% for four years. And so uh, I don't know exactly the figure for Spain, but uh, probably even slightly lower than the, the one for France. And you know the target which uh, the member states had agreed was that by 2020, 3% of GDP should be the average for, for EU. I mean, we are very far from that. So now, to come back to your very specific question about ERC, um, I think um, we, in a sense, I would not, well, I would try and see, uh, and I don't know the figure at the moment, if we add up uh, the budget for ERC, the budget for DFG, and the budget for ANR, which is not targeted, and so on. That is, we take the, all the countries and try to see what is bottom-up research and add up and uh, see how much we get. For sure, uh, we are not at the level of NSF at the moment. And as you know, at the moment, there is also a project that the NSF budget will be boosted with 100 billion, but also with a big change, which is the introduction of innovation into the picture of the NSF. So we don't know. But still, we, we know for, for ERC that a 4 billion budget was what we fought for at the level of the Scientific Council for the end of the Horizon Europe um, framework program. And uh, we are, will be very far from that. We'll probably be at 3 billion, because altogether the budget for ERC for, uh, for the uh, overall, uh, for the Horizon Europe 2021-2027 uh, period uh, will be typically uh, 12, will be typically uh, 16 billion altogether. So still not, uh, not enough. So I would say that uh, at the moment, uh, really looking at the, the present situation, a budget of 4 billion for ERC would uh, probably, if you add up what comes from uh, the various countries in terms of uh, bottom-up research, would make it comparable to the uh, support given in the US to the NSF. But of course, I should not only consider NSF, I should also look at NIH. Budget of NIH is over 30 billion. You have to be very careful because a lot of it goes to trials, as you know, and they are extremely expensive and, in a sense, very indirect support to private sector research. But nevertheless, another figure we have to keep in mind is what is the growth of the um, budget uh, in China for fundamental research. And presently, in the last years and the coming years, the increase will be 7% per year increase. So, so you see that we are talking about a different picture from the one we have here, uh, where definitely the budget for ERC from Horizon 2020 to Horizon Europe has grown about 20%, but over a seven-year period. So it's nothing comparable to 7% per year of, of uh, increase. So I think uh, it's always difficult when, uh, because uh, the share of uh, the support coming from uh, Euro European budget to the research is so small compared to what comes from the countries uh, that uh, it makes the comparison very difficult to make. Thank you. So uh, I will now read uh, one of the questions that are in the chat. So, uh, Luis Rovira, who is the chair of uh, Circa, you know probably, uh, says the following, so I will just uh, read uh, his uh, question. In Catalonia, Circa research centers, uh, ICFOS, ERG, EDVAPS, uh, uh, One2Cat, uh, ERV, IDEC, among others, have been very active in Horizon 2020, teaching over uh, 500 million euros funding creating 200 spin-off companies, being awarded more than 200 ERC grants, etc. It's very ambitious. Uh, it, in addition, they all implement open, transparent, merit-based recruitment, and circus centers uh, multiply, let me see, I had the problem now. Circa centers multiply at least by three the structural money allocated on them. My question is, 
what else could be done to increase visibility of circa centers at European level? issue because it's uh, partly based on facts that is uh, what people have been doing and then efforts and uh, networks built to carry over this information to a broader public and the broader public can be uh, students can be a general public uh, but can be also uh, policy makers and so um, you know I would say uh, if you want to address this issue of making these uh, results better known I think you probably have to look at these different categories and to see for each of these categories which would be the most relevant uh, mechanism by which you can reach out to them. And of course, they are quite different. I mean, uh, typically for politicians, wh what is very important is both to produce uh, quite uh, well-structured documents to meet them regularly and uh, to offer them to really come and visit uh, the facilities and uh, some events in which they can really be confronted with the researchers. For the general public, it's a different issue. I mean, you, you have to use, uh, of course, the press today is, uh, is rather different from uh, what it used to be. Uh, of course, social media play a very key role. That's why uh, the ERC is uh, very active, actually, on social media. And actually, there is every week, um, uh, a summary of uh, all articles which have been dealing, or social media significant events, which have been dealing with uh, either ERC grantees or ERC issues or, and so on. And the average, uh, every week, there is about 300 articles dealing with ERC in the, in, the, in the media. And by the way, the difference between the countries uh, for this is uh, extremely, is extreme, because uh, I think, for example, uh, in average, uh, if I go back to the year 2020, there were six times more articles on ERC in Spain than in France. And of course, there are not six times more ERC grants in Spain than in France. But France is more or less at the absolute bottom of uh, coverage of ERC in the press. It's amazing. I mean, it's, I think if you rank uh, and, of course, take into account the size of the country, France is number 25 out of 27 countries. So we're only beaten by Malta. So, so it's uh, very interesting. Uh, and when you talk with journalists about that, uh, most of the time the scientific journalists tell you it's very simple. When I submit an article to my editor-in-chief, uh, it, it's never published. So even if the journalists write, actually, it, it doesn't go out. So this is for the general public. But of course, uh, very important is also to make it known to students. And uh, of course, for students, it's a different issue because you have to relate uh, the, uh, what you offer them in terms of uh, education, in terms of courses, with the research which is done. And uh, now it's something which I'm sure is done here in Barcelona, which is uh, to connect more and more often early in the courses, curriculum of students, uh, with research and, uh, and to associate them to research project and so on. So I think depending on the public, I think the tools to develop and the efforts to make are quite different, which means that, first of all, scientists have to be aware of these uh, difficulties, but probably they have to be supported by people with the right competence in terms of, of the, to develop these efforts. But I think it's uh, today uh, this issue has become uh, central. We cannot live in, a, in our planet and forget about the other ones because it would be deadly altogether, uh, also for the general understanding of what research brings to society at large. Thank you. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, have an interaction with him, but uh, OK. So, are there more questions? Yes, please. Angel. Thank you very much for that really interesting uh, lecture of you. And let's, I don't know if this could be a little provocative, this, this question, but maybe I'd be interested to have your, your point of view. I mean, nowadays, although I'm retired, but I've been in research for many years. But I think that we are living in, I don't know, from 
the late 80s and the 90s up to, up to here with many, many people in research in the world. A lot of money also. I kind of see a lot of publications that are, I mean, it's almost impossible to reach all, even in your specific field. But in comparison what, to what occurred, let's say, for, in the, for instance, in the first part of the 20th century in physics, in the second half of the 19th century in chemistry, or even, I don't know, in this. I mean, do you think that uh, with all those means, all those uh, facilities, all those, do we have fundamental discoveries in the, in the last 50 years that can, uh, I mean, can, can be compared with those that we have, for instance, in, as I mentioned, uh, in those fields many, many years ago with much less money, with much, much less, uh, uh, let's say, uh, funds, with, I, don't, I, I think that, that maybe we are progressing a lot in technology, but what about fundamental discoveries in science that can make really revolutions like it was that coming from Einstein or I don't know, from any from Van Hoff or any of those? Or, or, or what, what is your point about that? What are, well, are we doing now? Of course, one would have to be specific to answer your question, but look at what happened in biology. I mean, uh, the, the concept of DNA uh, is not 50 years, but not much more. And uh, sequencing of the human genome was considered uh, uh, some kind of a extraordinary, uh, um, uh, extraordinary effort mobilizing uh, uh, billions and uh, all countries altogether. When basically now we do it uh, for I don't know 50 euros, uh, and that was decisive to deal with uh, with the pandemic, that we could really test uh, at a very uh, I mean sophisticated level. So I think these transformations have have been uh, only possible because of an extraordinary combination of technology and knowledge. Uh, in the case of the mRNA vaccine, I think. Uh, it's a remarkable uh, thing that is first to understand why, uh, of course, what was first discovered was DNA, not RNA. But then very soon it was clear that the way DNA was producing something real in the cells was through the uh, RNA, uh, because that's the RNA which produced the proteins. And so all this process of analyzing these uh, and the role of the networks, which have, uh, really makes the the, 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 I mean, the, the actual functioning of the of the uh, of the cell uh, possible. Uh, this happened in, in very recent years. I mean, the the, the jump from the sequencing of the human genome uh, is is just uh, 20 years ago, and 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 so and this has been a complete transformation of uh, medicine and uh, really the, also the focus of biology, which uh, became much much easier. So I think uh, it would be a mistake by scientists to say that they don't care about technology, but it would be a mistake to believe that technology can be developed uh, without uh, basic knowledge. An example I like to give because uh, I find it really uh, wonderful, uh, which is a, a, an, an example about uh, a, a mathematical impact of um, a, a totally new technique uh, which has to do with statistics. One thing which bothered people for a lot of time, when they were doing scanners for babies, or, or was the difficulty to get a, a clean image just because the baby was moving. And uh, actually, uh, from the measurement you could get uh, from just getting a scanning of a moving uh, and not controlled movement, uh, very difficult to predict, um, some people de derived totally new uh, statistical uh, analysis, which is really a, a new branch of statistics, uh, with uh, using uh, so-called scarce data. And, and this is, in terms of, uh, I mean, uh, theoretical knowledge, a completely new approach to, to statistics, um, which, uh, of course, the impact on medical imaging, that's one of the examples I mentioned in, in passing uh, was was there and uh, was was then made possible 
so, so I think uh, we have to be careful in, uh, uh, so I gave, of course, the DNA example. In the case of uh, physics, as you know, um, the, the most uh, important revolution has been, uh, for sure, the, uh, the quantum mechanics uh, in the early part of the 20th century. But as you know, uh, people insist that there has not been one uh, revolution in quantum physics. There has been a second <laughs> revolution in quantum physics, which is very much connected to uh, quantum information and entanglement, which was really for a long, long time considered in physics as some kind of a bizarre thing. Today, it's not anymore a bizarre thing. It's something you can create in your lab, and you want to use it to develop new tools. And this requires very deep uh, new understanding of uh, still in the spirit of quantum mechanics, but pushing it to really completely new boundaries. So I think we can really uh, uh, give a quite long list. Of course, I'm not going to bother you with the mathematics and transformation of algebraic geometry by Alexander Grotendieck, for example, which was uh, happened in the in 1960s. Uh, which was a completely new approach to, to mathematics, which led to a number of new results in mathematics, for which the impact on, uh, I would say, technology is not, uh, not yet uh, really concrete, but could become concrete uh, tomorrow, because in, in the end, the impact on number theory is very significant. And as you know, number theory is uh, absolutely fundamental for cybersecurity and uh, really um, uh, cryptology and things like this. So, so I think uh, I understand your question, and in particular the, uh, the figure I always give when I talk about uh, strictly on mathematics, the number of people attending the second European, the uh, second international congress in Paris in 1900 was, I think, 170 people, and at that time people considered that the number of people present were about one third of all mathematicians in the world. Of course, now, the mathematical community, it's difficult to measure it, but it's about 100,000 people. But that's a very small community if you compare it to the community of biologists. I think people consider they are in the world about two to three million biologists. So we are a very small community compared to the biologists. And of course, you could, uh, you, you could consider that uh, there should be uh, much more things. But actually, the number of new things happening is really uh, is still very, very considerable in, um, in uh, of course, I, I can give very precise statements concerning my field, which is mathematics. I'm much less able to do that for other fields, but I'm sure people could uh, come up with a similar comment. But of course, it's, uh, uh, your question is completely uh, legitimate. I mean, it's, uh, we have to know how much this invests and produces, but actually, uh, all, all analysis which have been made, I know in the case of mathematics, for example, what is the part of the economy which depends on recent mathematics? And regularly, the countries which have done that, Netherlands was the first one, then UK continued, then France did it, then Japan did it, and so on. People ended up with figures which were completely, uh, uh, I mean, uh, surprising to people because they, I mean, really talking to people in industry, that about 30% of the, uh, what has been produced by industry were actually dependent on recent mathematics. So it meant uh, that uh, this process that you were uh, questioning whether it has produced some things, even if you look at it from strictly uh, productive point of view, which uh, I think, uh, of course, as a mathematician interested in philosophy, I think you also have to think about the conceptual impact, I mean, the cultural impact. But if you, even if you look at just the very concrete uh, practical consequences in terms of uh, production, industrial production, uh, I think it's very, very considerable. Thank you very much. Thank you. So just, just a comment about, about uh, your answer. So uh, there exist also in, in, in Spain so this uh, analysis of the impact of uh, mathematics in uh, economics and uh, social sector. And actually, it was the subject of one of these colloquia, one of the first ones given by Professor Sola Morales. So just an anecdote, but yeah. So I mean, it was very, very interesting to know. And many people were, so to say, surprised about, about the figures. Yeah. 
By the way, France is doing it again this fall, so we'll see what comes out. And again, talking a lot to people in industry to get their genuine appreciation of, of the process. So we shall see what comes out of it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Alicia, please. Uh, I have the impression that uh, for us researchers, the life is uh, harder and harder as time passes. I would like to know your impression. First, I thought that it was here in Catalonia and in Spain in general that we get less funds for research. But then my impression was it was more general in France and other countries. Uh, what do you think? Uh, the, the funds for research is not enough. Maybe there are too many researchers uh, doing research and maybe doing the same thing. Uh, how do you see the balance? Uh, potential people doing research and the funds uh, beh behind. Uh, for example, I was in a reviewer uh, session in Europe for uh, uh, Horizon 2020, and it was really depressing see how many people doing reviews and how few, uh, how, uh, how few of them succeeded in, uh, in them. So it's like discouraging to, to apply. And maybe this can be related with uh, the very big projects like uh, the flag uh, projects that were uh, uh, promoted some time ago in front of, of more uh, money for more people. Mm -hmm. How you see this balance? Well, it's, it's very difficult to, to answer your question because uh, what you are, um, uh, why is it difficult to answer it? Because you see the, um, the way when uh, research is conducted is extremely diverse. And depending uh, on the fields, depending on uh, uh, the, even the, the way research can be organized is not the same. In some disciplines, mathematics is one of them. Uh, uh, individual work still plays a very key role. Never isolated people, always connected to a network, but uh, in a way in which your own uh, production very often still is meaningful. In some other project, if you think of uh, LHT, for example, in, uh, in CERN, uh, it's just a few hundred people working together. And when they publish, they publish uh, with an article with uh, 500, 600 signatures. So it's totally different uh, thing. And of course, all in between, they are all different things. So, so therefore, um, my, uh, my belief on that is that uh, it's very, very important to let the communities decide what they consider is the most efficient way of developing their research. It's clear that for some of the research, the planning for developing new instruments is very critical. If you think of the telescopes or all kinds of uh, instruments like that, uh, which means uh, you have to plan many years ahead. Uh, you, you have to train the people a uh, long time ahead bef before you can actually uh, do the work uh, and so on. In some of the fields, things are much shorter. And uh, so therefore, um, if you want to give uh, an answer to your question, that is, uh, are we uh, wasting money because too many people are doing the same thing and so on? I think it, uh, it has to do with uh, how can communities, scientific communities organize themselves better. And from that point of view, uh, I think we still have a lot of progress to make. And altogether, um, I've been rather disappointed, for example, on, on the front of open science, that uh, the communities really uh, did not uh, organize themselves in a way to really have more weight on uh, how this could be done. And which led to this, uh, for me, completely inadequate situation where the funders decided they would be the leaders of open science, which for me doesn't make any sense. It's not the funders to decide that because there is such a diversity of the ways in which you can make open science a reality that only the scientific communities can decide. Uh, but of course, in order for this to be accepted, uh, recognized, you need to, need to see signs of self-organization by the scientific communities. And it's true that uh, some communities didn't really do their, their job from that point of view. Uh, of course, when we talk about open science, there are two, two sides of the coin. One is, of course, access to publication, but the other side is, of course, uh, sharing data. Uh, and, but you know, sharing data doesn't mean something at individual level. 
what mean, makes sense for sharing data is that some communities agree on what is relevant data and how they can be shared. You have to define protocols for that. You have to agree on the protocols. You have to train people to put the protocols in place and so on. And this can only happen if uh, enough uh, people with the same practice agree. Uh, if you do that in your corner, it's not going to be to help anybody. So I think all these issues show that uh, probably uh, the scientific communities have not made enough effort to organize themselves. And you can say that this is the consequence of people have been so much fighting to get support that they didn't have time to really consider more collective issues where really they, uh, they, they work together rather than against the others. And of course, from that point of view, uh, the fact that uh, money was, was too short uh, really distorted the whole thing because people were trying just to survive. And usually when you, the efforts you make to survive usually are not the most efficient efforts because uh, it's fully understandable why you make these efforts, but they are not the ones which for the future are actually the, 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 the best ones. So that's why I think uh, getting a, a better policy at national level in terms of uh, having enough uh, bulk funding and uh, also enough uh, success, uh, higher, high enough success rates for uh, project funding is very important because I think it will have other consequences on the, I would say, the sociology of the scientific community and uh, you could hope that the scientific community will dedicate more energy to organize themselves without being told by the authorities of all kinds, uh, funders or public, uh, political authorities, how they should do things. Uh, but, um, and again, uh, the, from one field to the other, uh, this uh, level of, uh, I don't know how to call it, but maybe maturity varies a lot. And uh, I must say from that point of view, uh, mathematicians are probably not the best position because I think we could do more. Uh, I think, uh, but it's it's very difficult because for many people it's considered some kind of almost like a, a distraction from their normal work. When I think uh, I don't think it's a distraction at all because it's a condition for the work to be developed and impactful at the right level. And uh, and actually this can also lead to young people to say that they don't want to belong to this group which actually is not able to organize itself in a, in a certain way. Because I, my feeling is that the next generation is much more sensitive to these issues than, uh, than my generation for, for which, for example, uh, tough com competition was uh, acceptable. For the younger generation, I think a very tough competition is not uh, what they strive for. They don't find it really adequate for good development in the same way as maybe my generation accepted it. And I think we're wrong in accepting it too much. In particular in the last 20 years where I think the main shift has happened. I don't know, well, that's a personal opinion, so maybe I'm completely wrong. But, uh. Thank you. So people are not very active in the net. So uh, are some more questions here? No? I have one question. Uh, well, this is more related uh, to the first part of, uh, of your uh, speech, your presentation. It's about uh, so the problem that uh, we have to, to uh, um, attract young people to stay doing research. And uh, I think that this is very much related to the second problem you mentioned, that is that they don't see a long-term clear perspective. This is a very old problem in Europe, so it's not new. It doesn't, you know, it has no, no relation with the pandemic, in my opinion. So maybe now it's worse. But uh, so you have been very much uh, involved in uh, European institutions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I see that there is a very big, big uh, a different style in the United States and in Europe. So I mean, how much the discussion in Europe has been uh, pushed forward? Uh, in order to, to make this career more attractive and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, more simple, so to see a, a long-term perspective and not to... So I, I, I suppose that people move, to, move to, to industries, not only because of the salary, but uh, because uh, even if it is not a permanent position, 
So the, there is a much clearer uh, perspective. So what, uh, what can be done in this uh, Europe? I think, again, I don't think there is... Uh, I'm sorry, I don't think that what you said is, is uh, uniformly true. So it depends on, on fields, it depends on areas, and uh, um, I think uh, what I, I said, what characterized for me uh, really the, uh, the European situation is diversity. And uh, we have to make a t take advantage of this diversity rather than see it as an obstacle. But of course it can be an obstacle because uh, uh, when you have make a progress here, maybe uh, next, uh, next country actually you are going backward. So, so I think uh, to get uh, uh, proper information on uh, these so many different systems is extremely difficult. And actually, uh, that's one thing I, I realized uh, in my function as president of ERC and why I felt it was so important to visit people. Because unless you have visited people, you don't really understand uh, what are the obstacles they are facing. And, and these obstacles can be quite different from one country to the next. And, and so uh, I think that's one of, of the features which is uh, difficult. The second one uh, is you think of the European uh, programs, uh, you know the, the key, um, uh, since these programs are fixed for seven years, of course they are prepared during a quite long period. And I think uh, from, I saw from the preparation of the previous program, uh, that is the, of the present program, Horizon Europe, to, which was done uh, many years before, um, actually the involvement of the scientific community or the interest or the curiosity of the scientific communities for the preparation of this program was minimal. And I remember talking to a number of uh, presidents of uh, European societies on this, saying, well, you have to, uh, to make your point. You have to make the case for what you want to do. And um, I must say, uh, it was quite difficult to say, say no, but it's still not yet, uh, it's just a preparation and uh, we, we will act later. But of course, if you act when a document is already on the table, uh, which of course has already been part of a negotiation between the countries and so on, it's much harder to change the, the structure. So I think, uh, and of course, some scientists were involved in the preparation, but they are more uh, involved as individuals. So my point is, uh, I would hope that, uh, in a sense, more of the scientific uh, institutions, um, scientific um, uh, community—I mean, the representative of the scientific community, so typically learned societies or various uh, organizations—I'm very pleased to see that the uh, Initiative for Science in Europe is more active again. It has been really sleepy for, for, for some years. Now it's, uh, again, more active. Uh, so I think uh, they are really, you have to understand uh, in the context of the European uh, decision processes that there are really some critical moments. And if you miss these critical moments, to change things later is much harder. And of course, uh, not so many people are aware of that. But even if you call their attention to that, uh, they are not willing to, to make the effort necessarily. So I think, uh, for example, typically uh, the preparation of the next uh, framework program is going to start in the fall. Uh, and because, uh, yeah, that's uh, normal. It will take three years to produce it. And then if you add three years to 2023, it's uh, 2026, which is just the end of... Uh, almost the end of the program. In the meantime, the, the commission will be changed. The commission ends its mandate in 2024. And, and so, so I think uh, very soon it will be needed that people look into uh, whether you would like to change some uh, of the structures of the uh, framework program. And, and so, so I think we collectively, uh, but maybe actually the RC should play a bigger role in that. We have not been able to produce um, a, a process by which information is properly shared and that people understand what are the critical moments. Um, and, and we tend to act uh, as uh, scientific communities too late. Uh, and of course, all this is in a context which is complicated because from one country to the next, the governments change not at the same time. 
uh, and, and of course, uh, when you think you have a good contact with the minister, just next day he's not anymore there, or she's not anymore there, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, <laughs> so that makes life uh, a, bit, uh, a bit difficult. Um, because again, uh, if you want to act at political level, uh, it will not be through the parties, it will be really through very specific people. That's why uh, having a very uh, solid contact in the parliament is very important. Uh, that's why having some ministers with whom you can talk and uh, very directly interact. Uh, I can see this for the, this conference, which finally is going to take place on 7th of June. It's really uh, in a very face-to-face -face discussion with uh, Manuel Haito in his office uh, in the end of January this year that finally I, I could convince him uh, he could do something. And uh, he decided, okay, let's do it. Uh, but uh, although I'd been <laughs> pushing this for, for a year and uh, with, with basically no success, of course, I'm furious against the French government because I put this on the table of the minister just before the French presidency, but she didn't show any sign of interest, which for me is a scandal. And uh, I'm sorry to be brutal, but uh, she's not going to be minister in th four or five days, so it's, uh, it's fine. <laughs> No, but I think it's, I couldn't understand. I mean, uh, of course, uh, the level of involvement was a decision, but the issue is really on the table. You cannot miss this issue. I mean, it's absolutely critical. How can you miss that? I couldn't understand. It's, uh, it was a total mystery to me, I mean, really. But not only her. In the case of Germany, of course, the fact that there was no, um, no, minister, no, no ministry for some time was uh, complicated. Um, so, of course, you... I'm talking to the new state secretary, so I hope uh, we can do something. He, he seems to show some interest. He's completely coming from outside. He's a very young guy with no political experience, no experience with research, and, and so on. So you have to restart everything. And all his staff is new, completely new people. But this is the normal process, so you have to be aware this is the way it functions. And I don't think we, as a scientific community, have organized ourselves to address that. And we need to do it which, for example, a typical place where this should take place is in Brussels. So we should have, collectively, a much better organization in Brussels. I mean, I, I say scientific communities altogether. And, um, well, the French have been very weak. Uh, the, the Germans have been functioning very much by land, because you know the responsibility of universities is by lender. And uh, with a massive presence, a lot of activity and so on, but no coordinated action because the federal level in Germany, it doesn't play much a role. It's really the lender which play a role. And, uh, and with various um, level of uh, competence by the ministers, some are really remarkably competent, some don't care. Uh, so I think... Uh, that's my, uh, you, you could tell me now, what do you do to change that? And uh, really for the moment, uh, I've been uh, focusing on this uh, specific event, but maybe we should have uh, other things. Uh, actually, one thing I plan to do, uh, there will be, a, finally, the French organized a new, um, a new space for all uh, research, uh, French research organization to be together. They, they used to have something ridiculously small and uh, inefficient. So now they decided to have really what they called the uh, Irene uh, and Frédéric Joliot-Curie um, house. And there will be an inauguration, and I've already prepared, uh, I will be invited to give one of the speeches, so I will, just my speech is exactly about that. That is, we must do more. And uh, I say we, I'm not talking about the French, I'm talking all the scientific community. Because there are lots of... Uh, representative of scientific communities in Brussels. But they have to work together in a much more efficient way. Of course, they have their specific duties to represent their countries, but uh, if you want to reach a European decision, you have to act collectively. And for the moment, this has not happened, to my knowledge. So this initiative in France is like an umbrella? Of a yes, well, they really, physically now, it's really a quite nice uh, setting uh, with uh, offices and uh, really a nice conference room and so on. The Germans don't have to do that because uh, actually every land has its own house and uh, its own uh, amphitheaters and so on. So in a sense, there are plenty of activities and uh, 
for Spain, I don't know really. I've been invited once by CISIC, uh, so which, uh, but um, yes, that's what I've seen. But for example, uh, the main difference between Germany and France, for example, is that, as I said, all lender have a very remarkable representation in Brussels with uh, really big, uh, big uh, buildings, very nice buildings. Uh, the French regions are basically invisible. The only region I saw was Brittany, but not, for example, Ile de France, which is the largest region for research, has absolutely zero activity since Mrs. Uh, um, uh, um, since the new president of the region, uh, zero. I have not seen anybody, they have not organized any event, zero. When they are, I mean, really a very significant concentration of research. So Valérie Pécresse, from that point of view, has been uh, really totally insignificant. And okay, thank you. So, more questions? No? Okay, so there is nothing on the internet either. So I think that it's time to, to close this. So thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Gracias a todos por venir. Por... <coughs> I can provide my with. text in case you are interested. Yeah, 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 yeah. This would be this would be good. Yeah, because uh, well, it would be easier to, to follow. Thank you.